Hello everybody, I'm Ben Pierce from the Rosa Tracker, and today I'd like to talk to you about when we're next going to see Starman. Now, if you look around the internet, you can see in many places that they quote a date of 2091 as the next time that Starman will pass close enough to the Earth to be able to see it. This is based off of a paper, specifically a simulation that was used to write a paper in the very, very early days after Starman launched in space. You can see a link of this in the description. This paper put forward a simulation using some data that came from JPL Horizons and populated it forward with some uncertainty bounds to figure out what was going to happen with this in the long term if it would crash into Earth, into the Sun, into Jupiter, Mars, Venus, or whatever. And we would be able to figure out where it came from. When they calculated this simulation, they figured out in 2091 it was supposed to pass close to Earth. This was wrong, and we need to understand a little bit about where these observations came from in order to determine where it's wrong. So, as I mentioned, they used solution number seven. Solution one came from SpaceX, as published to JPL Horizons. They were able to take that data and propagate it forward to the point where they would know where it was in the future. The very early solutions were only accurate for a few years. They didn't try to take it much beyond that point in time because they just didn't know its location certain enough to do that. As they continued along, they got more certain they extended this data arc. Solution 7 was one of the early ones that was a relatively stable solution. By that point in time, they had it pretty well established and they had even said that unless they had some really high quality data, they thought they might have as good as they were going to get. But it was continued to be tracked up until March 19th where it was received by a station in South Africa. They were able to track it. And using this data of a month and a half, they were able to get a much more accurate orbital trajectory. Now, what components go into making an accurate orbital trajectory? Well, there's three main components that show up in this kind of trajectory. The first one is gravity of the orbit, the object that you're orbiting, in this case, the sun. Now, if you know the speed and you know the position very accurately for the roadster, which we had some pretty good measurements of, then you can propagate that forward really, really accurately. And so that wasn't really a significant contribution. The problem is, though, that this can actually change. Now, the second form is another type of gravitational thing. When it flies close past a planet, such as the Earth or Mars, which both of which are entirely possible with its current orbit, it can change the trajectory somewhat. If you can get a good enough prediction of where it's going to pass by these, you can understand these really well, but these effects can really significantly change your orbit. In order to measure them, you have to know exactly where the object was. Okay, so what about the third effects? Well, the third effects are non-gravitational acceleration. Now, this might seem a little bit strange, but we have non-gravitational acceleration on Earth all the time. If you drop out of an airplane, you're not going to fall at the speed of gravity all the way down to the ground. You're going to slow down due to air resistance, and that will slow you down. Well, there isn't any air in space, but there is a couple of things that can happen. There are three primary non-gravitational acceleration things that we're going to talk about. The first one is outgassing. Now, outgassing you can think of a comet. When it's heated up, it will shoot out a jet of water vapor that will push it in a particular direction. That's outgassing and it's a very basic effect. Have outgassing that can show up through a number of things that are on the roadster. The, anything organic, like plastics or whatever, when exposed to radiation of the sun will tend to melt and sublimate and it will cause some kind of outgassing. So there's a lot of things that are on the roadster that could possibly outgas. But the thing is though that it's rotating fairly fast and that rotation is going to tend to have the outgassing happen in all of the same direction. So it's not going to be particularly favorable to change its acceleration much and it's probably not the significant contributor in the long run. The second effect is the Yarkovsky effect. This is my favorite effect in talking about 
the orbital tracks of small objects, probably because it's such a fun word to say, Yarkovsky. Basically what happens here is you have one side of an asteroid is hotter than another. It's almost always warmer in the very early hours of the night than it is in the very late hours of the evening. <clears throat> As the evening continues, temperatures cool down. The hotter something is, the more energy it is radiating. And that energy will tend to radiate away from the surface of the object in a way to accelerate it along the direction of movement. This can have a pretty significant effect in the long term of the orbit of the satellite. It's something to keep in mind, but because it's rotating so fast, it's really not going to have that kind of temperature differential that you would have in an asteroid that was rotating on the period of hours instead of minutes. The orbital period of the roadster last we detected was about five minutes, so it's really fast. The third effect, though, is something they were able to quantify pretty accurately, and it's in the form of radial pressure, pressure that's pushing directly against the roadster. Specifically, there's two things that kind of combine together. The biggest one by far is solar radiation pressure. Now, many of you have probably heard of a solar sail. Essentially, any time you have a light showing on something, it will push you in that particular direction. If you reflect the light, it will double the amount of force that actually comes from it. If you absorb it, you only get half of the effect. This solar pressure can be used if you have something very, very thin to send a spacecraft to visit other planets. And the Planetary Society has been building solar sails. They've even used one to go to the planet Venus. Starman is primarily has the mass of the upper stage of the Falcon Heavy. That's a relatively large, relatively low density object. And so it's not built as a solar sail, but it will have a little bit of pressure coming from the sunlight. And according to solution 10 of JPL Horizons, there's going to be something on the order of meters per second per year change in delta V. That doesn't sound very much, but I pulled it up in Universe Sandbox and I plugged in the number 50 meters per second, which is about the amount that it'll change on the order of the next 30 years, and the orbital period can change by days at this point in time. So these small effects can actually have a really, really long effect over the long term. Now it's radial, it's not a, as effective as it would be if you were, say, pushing it from the side, but it's still there and it's something to keep in mind. And I think it's primarily this one that the paper that stated 2091, well, that the author stated 2091 was when it was going to pass close to the Earth used to make that determination. When you take that into account, the closest pass in 2091 right now is predicted to be somewhere around three-tenths of an AU, which is not particularly close. You might be able to see it with a really, really high power telescope, but we're going to have a much, much closer pass here, and we're going to talk about that. So let's talk about when it's going to pass close to planets. The first planet it's going to pass close to, again, is not Earth. It's actually the planet Mars. In 2020, October, it's going to pass relatively close to the planet Mars, about 7 million kilometers, 5 million miles or so from the surface of the planet. It'll be a magnitude 22, 23 object at that point in time, which is pretty dim. You could see it with a really high power telescope on Earth, but it would be difficult to see with anything less than that. Are there any instruments on Mars that could actually image it? Well, first of all, let me say this. There's no new instrument that we could possibly send to Mars that would be able to capture this. It's just too far away. The trajectories don't match up. So even if we had the instrument ready today, we couldn't send it. But would we be able to image it with what we have there? Well, let's start with the landers. Most of the objects on landers are about the size of maybe my fist, the images. And that's just not that power of a telescope. They're meant to image the relatively bright surface of the planets, not something very dim. But there's a much more powerful telescope in orbit. So let's talk about high-rise. 
High Rise is about a half meter in diameter. It's a relatively large size. It's about um, a third of the diameter of the Hubble telescope, a little bit more than that. So it has a fairly significant power. And if it was as stable and of the same form as the Hubble Space Telescope, it could probably image it. But there's a couple of problems with high rise. See, high rise is meant to image down. It's meant to image the planet below it. It's what's called a push broom camera. Now, the easiest way you can think of a push broom camera is think of a scanner on a copy machine. You have this scanner that will move line by line, seeing what is in the picture, and then it moves on to the next line and keeps moving. So the paper stays still, the scanner moves along the document, and will image it. Well, it turns out that that's not really the best way to do a astronomy observation. It works perfectly for high-rise, because high-rise basically will point down, the planet moves beneath it, and it can image the surface and get these nice long images. And it can make it longer if there are a couple of things that are of interest, that it can make it quite long. It has, the width is fixed, but the length is not. So high rise has been used to image stars before, and it can do it. But what it has to do is point in a part of the sky and rotate the camera in order to have the simulated motion of the Earth beneath it. And quite frankly, that doesn't work very well for imaging as dim of objects as you would have to have. Hubble would be able to do it because it could point at the same point in the sky for about six minutes or more without moving at all. High rise has to move just to make the image in the first place. So it really is not designed for that kind of purpose and it wouldn't actually be able to image it. Furthermore, because we don't know exactly where it is, and because it's so dim, it would take more than one image. So you'd have to sit there and scan back and forth, back and forth. It's a very risky maneuver for the spacecraft, and there's no way they would allow it to be used in that manner. We talked a little bit about Hubble, though. Could Hubble actually image Star Mad from where it is? The answer is yes, it could actually image Star Mad from a distance of almost 2 AU away from Earth. And most of the time during its orbit, it will be closer than that. But people have already tried to talk Hubble into doing it. And quite frankly, they're not going to do that. They would have to have an hour or more of time dedicated to just observing Starman. And nobody is going to pay for that to happen. So, you know, talk to NASA, talk to your congressman. Maybe they could work something out, but it's probably not going to happen. Okay. So what about some future close approaches? Well, the next close approach to a planet is in 2035, and it's the planet Mars again, and this one will be even closer than the previous one. It will pass a little over 2 million kilometers, about a million and a half miles or so from the surface of Mars. It's much, much closer. It should be significantly brighter. If SpaceX has their way in 2035, we probably will have humans on the surface of Mars. And there might be enough of them that we'll be able to build a nice observatory there, and maybe we'll be able to see Starman by then. I don't really know. When is the next time, though, it's going to pass close to Earth? That answer is in 2047. It's going to pass pretty close to Earth, about 5 million kilometers, 3 million miles or so away from the surface of the planet. At that point in time, any of the large telescopes will be able to see it. Starman was last seen about 10 million kilometers away from Earth, so it should be easy to see it at half the distance, although not knowing exactly where it is is going to make it a little bit more difficult. But still, a half meter wide telescope could probably do the trick pretty nicely. A full meter wide would be great, and by that point in time we'll probably have much better cameras, so something that's a half meter will be entirely possible. The backyard astronomer with a really, really good telescope might be able to see it, and I have a fairly good idea that we'll be able to see it at that point in time. Once we can see it then, we can probably track it for hundreds of years, knowing its path over the course of the last 30 years pretty accurately. be pretty exciting. Hopefully we'll be able to see it then. If you want to see what Starman would see, then click on the link over here, and thanks for joining me, and until next time, keep on tracking. Take care.